Thank you for joining Jennifer Shouse and Associates in our 2019 webinar Wednesday series. We are coming to you live from downtown Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday, and you can find the upcoming schedule on our website. Past webinars and our recordings are also on our website and on our YouTube channel, along with over 160 other recordings on federal contracting topics. All are complimentary. If you have questions for our speaker today, you can email him directly with the contact information you'll see on the last slide. And this is just a little bit about us. We are a Washington, D.C.-based firm and provide services for federal contractors. This ranges from market analysis reports to proposal writing and also post-award compliance. More information is on our website, so please visit us there. This is an upcoming event that you can find more information here also on our website. And we do offer advertising, so you can email me if you would like more information on that. And our webinar today is sponsored by AccuTrack. Here's a short message from them. AccuTrack Consulting and Accounting Services is an 8A WOSB CPA firm committed to supporting entities sustain growth in government contracting. Our outstanding DCAA accounting solutions reduce audit risk, improve cash flows, and give you peace of mind. Contact us today to learn how we can enhance your DCAA accounting efforts. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Our speaker today is Don Kimenez, and he's going to be covering basics of new GovCon revenue recognition. Uh, Don, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for uh, participating today. I'm happy to be here and happy to talk about the, this major topic. And uh, I guess we can go to the first slide. So, uh, major changes are coming. Uh, the new revenue recognition standard is going to be a game changer. Uh, it uh, went into effect for public companies, uh, I believe it was last year, and this year it affects private companies. And um, it's uh, pretty late in the year, actually, to be tackling this, but um, you know, all is not lost, there's still time. Um, if, if you uh, aren't aware, this, this new standard was something like seven years in the making. Uh, it went through numerous iterations. It was going to be issued and become effective uh, several times prior to uh, this year, and it kept getting postponed. And the reason was <clears throat> because of feedback that the Financial Accounting Standard Board uh, received about the complexity of it and the lack of interpretation guidance and so on. So it, it, it's a big one. So uh, next slide. So uh, for many years, the gap, general separate accounting principles uh, governing revenue recognition have, have just become a hydra of standards and pronouncements. They're just a real hodgepodge, uh, things all over the place. Um, and some of you will, will I'll, I'll, at some point here, I'm going to refer to a couple of the original pronouncements. But as uh, most of you know, uh, I, I imagine uh, the accounting uh, the FASB, Financial Accounting Standards Board, but I'll say FASB from now on, uh, produced a codification of accounting standards in 2005 that was intended to replace all of the different sources of what up to then constituted authoritative gap. And so starting in 2005, the only authoritative source of, of gap for private companies uh, is the FASB codification. Uh, public companies still have to, uh, of course, Pay attention to the SEC and the PCAOB, which is the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. But these various standards, uh, you know, were confusing. They were, you know, at times conflicting. They lacked guidance because they were developed piecemeal over time and often didn't take each other into account. So we can go to the next slide. Um, now, many of you may not recognize this next one by name, but uh, it, it's highly likely that at least some, if not most, of you have been relying on it and using it. And that's called uh, the AICPA's Statement of Position because there was a time when the AICPA, uh, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, played a role in accounting standard setting. In fact, they were the main standard setting uh, board until, or entity, until the FASB was created. Uh, back in, I want to say, the late 70s, early 80s. Um, but even after that, the AICPA continued to publish pronouncements and uh, audit and, and accounting and auditing guides, and companies have, have uh, you know, continued to rely on those. 
old habits die hard. So this SOP 811 was is was very critical to government contractors for one major reason. The title was accounting for performance of construction type and certain production type contracts. But we could shorten that to say, in essence, that it referred to how to account for long-term contracts. And of course, government contracts in many instances um, are long-term contracts. Uh, I've been at this for 40 years, so I've seen the industry evolve. Uh, you know, things like blanket purchase orders and GWACs and things like that that didn't exist years ago. I can remember when the GSA supply schedule was literally an office supply catalog for government agencies, and of course, that's all changed. Um, but the the big the big reason companies re re relied on this is because if you had a fixed price contract that extended for several years, typically a base year and uh, you know four option years, let's say, uh, and it was conceived of as a single activity, you know, maybe it was producing something of a service nature like software, or you know, in some cases building something if you're Boeing or whatever, uh, and so the notion was. Uh, that uh, companies should be able to recognize revenue and profit as the work proceeded. Uh, and I want, to, I want to make a point here that this goes back to a, a, what we used to call a pervasive principle in GAAP many years ago called the matching principle. And the matching principle held that you know, revenue uh, should be recognized in the year in which it is, re is produced and, and cost should be recognized in the year that produced that revenue. Believe it or not, that matching principle is largely gone today. Um, modern GAAP focuses more on the balance sheet. Matching concept was an income statement concept. Modern GAAP focuses on the balance sheet and says, has an asset been created or has a liability been incurred? All right. In any event, this SOP was modified years ago to exclude service contracts. But either a lot of GCs were just unaware of that change uh, because it wasn't very prominent or they just chose to ignore it. And that meant that they continued to rely on it and they continued to account for government, long-term government contracts on the basis provided in 811. And that meant using, for the most part, cost to cost. So, which is one of the method, uh, methods in the SAP. So you could go in there and you say, okay, uh, my total estimated cost for this contract, which you'd update each year with a new uh, estimate to complete, uh, are X and my cost to date are Y and therefore I'm X percent complete. Frankly, that wasn't really permitted and hasn't been for a long time. At least it, it wasn't justified under 811 because service contracts were excluded. Um, and then of course that SOP was completely superseded as authoritative gap in 2005 when the codification was re released. Now much of it was incorporated into the codification, uh, but it, you know, it wasn't put in there verbatim, and again, it excluded service contracts. So next slide. All right, so we've already talked about this. Uh, contractors continue to use it. The new standard, formerly known as, it was originally issued as Accounting Standards Update 2014-09, which just means it was the ninth one in 2014, uh, with, the, with the creation of the codification in 2005, uh, future updates to that are called accounting standards updates. You may remember that we used to have uh, standards of financial accounting um, issued by the FASB. Now we have updates. All right. So that the the issuance of this uh, new update and its effective date, you know, this year removes basically any possibility of falling back on that old cost to cost percentage of completion uh, approach. Um, at, at least using SOP 81 or any, any other basis as the justification for it. Um, and in the second seminar we'll be doing later today, a webinar, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But go ahead and go to the next slide. So uh, I talked primarily about fixed price contracts up to this point, but the new standard, as you'll see in, in a moment, also has the potential to affect T&M and cost plus contracts. I think for most contractors that's going to be true to a lesser degree. Uh, so those contracts will be a little easier to deal with under the new standard uh, than the fixed price contracts, which are going to require more scrutiny. Uh, the new standard is incorporated in the codification as a new topic, 606. That's going to have referred to it from here on out. I'll think that's topic 606. And the topic supersedes most of the current topic 605, as well as a lot of other industry-specific guidance. Uh, the FASB's intent here 
and they work with the International uh, Accounting Standards Board on this as well. This is part of their uh, uh, convergence project, as they call it, convergence of standards. Uh, the idea was to come up with something that was uh, less prescriptive. Uh, U.S. GAAP has a, has a reputation as being very prescriptive, very detailed, whereas international GAAP is object or objective oriented. It says, here's what we're trying to accomplish, and here are the basic principles that should underlie that. And so that's why if you pick up a, a copy of the codification, it's about three times as thick as the IASB's uh, codification. Uh, this new topic 606 specifically supersedes, and I put this in quotes, some cost guidance included in subtopic 60535, revenue recognition, construction type, and production type contracts, which essentially replicated much of SOP 811, which hasn't applied as a set service contracts for years, but which has been uh, remained in use nonetheless. So let's go on what topic, six, topic 606 now requires. Next slide, okay. So the core of this standard is based on a five-step approach to evaluating contracts. All right, and this is gonna be a high-level overview. If you're sticking around for the second webinar, we'll get into a little bit more of the weeds. But let's go through the steps. So the first thing to do is to identify the contract or contracts with customers. That sounds simple, uh, or it may sound simple. You think, I got a government contract. Okay, well, we're gonna find out later that that is not necessarily the way this standard looks at it. Uh, the, what, what we think of as a contract is not necessarily the same thing as the standard uh, embraces as a contract or, or anticipates as a contract. Second thing you do is you identify the performance obligations in the contract. These are the things that you're required to provide. Uh, for a lot of, for, for many types of companies, you know, this will be very, very simple. You know, it might be a simple service. If you're a barber shop, you know, you give a haircut. You've done the, you've, you've, you've com completed your, uh, your obligation. Um, but in a government contract, as all of you know, uh, there are typically many performance obligations, at least potentially, buried in the contract. Uh, and why we might have tended to see those as um, uniform uh, or, or as a single thing in the, in the larger perspective, we're now not going to be automatically allowed to default to that larger perspective. We're gonna actually have to look to see if there are separate performance obligations. The next thing you have to do is determine the transaction price, and that means the transaction price associated with the contract. Again, it sounds simple, and in many times, it will be relatively straightforward, but I'm gonna show you some examples where it won't be. Then you allocate that transaction price to the performance obligations. And again, that might sound simple because you might think, well, my contract has all these different pricing elements in it. It prices at the task level, the optioneer level, the CLIN level, so what's the big deal? Um, well, GAP doesn't look at those as necessarily representing the appropriate transaction price uh, because anybody can play around with pricing. Uh, uh, and so we're gonna see again that that's a little more complicated. And then finally, once you've split out the performance obligations to the extent they require splitting out and you've allocated a portion of the transaction price to those performance obligations, you then recognize revenue winner or as the entity satisfies a performance obligation. So there could be a series of performance obligations embedded in a contract. And in fact, I think you're going, we're going to see that that is indeed the case. So let's briefly look at how each of these will affect GC revenue recognition and our approach to uh, determining it. So we can go to the next slide. Uh, let's see, I'm not going to, the, I'm not seeing it. Next slide, please. There we go. Okay, so you've got to identify the contracts with customers. The topic identifies a contract as an agreement between two or more parties that creates enforceable rights and obligations. And while that might seem straightforward, we're going to have questions. So, for example, is an option year contained in an award, in an award for which funds have not been obligated? Because remember, the government cannot legally obligate funds beyond its current fiscal year. And that's why option years are not, you know, cons considered to be. Um, to be legal obligations. Um, are those considered a legally enforceable contract? The answers to things like this aren't clear cut. Judgment's gonna be required, and you know, as I've written here, the devil is in the details. What we're going to see is uh, an evolution over time. The FASB will certainly be coming out with additional guidance. CPA firms are gonna be posing questions. 
In the interim, one of the things we'll probably be looking at are the 10 Ks filed by public companies for the last year uh, that are government contractors to see how they've handled some of these things. Uh, the SEC is a stern taskmaster, and so and then typically those are done by, if not big four accounting firms, at least very large accounting firms that handle public companies. But um, this is just one example of where th this won't be so straightforward. Uh, let's go to the next step. So identify the performance obligations in the contract. So this is going to be one of the biggest challenges for a lot of government contractors. If you look at an average government contractor, a lot of them have multiple elements. And multiple elements is a term that the uh, county literature has used for some, some time now. Uh, because increasingly, over time, uh, companies have been offering more complex uh, things. If you go to a cell phone provider, you're getting, you may be getting a cell phone. Uh, then you're renting it and you're paying for it by the month, you're getting maintenance on it, you might be also buying a warranty on it, and you're buying, of course, service. And all of those things are actually different elements and, and under this new standard would be different performance obligations. In the government contracting realm, realm multiple elements could consist of things like option years, task, CLINs, uh, possibly even, uh, you know, other things, you know, that are part of the work breakdown structure. Each of these is potentially a separate performance obligation. And then it, it, once it's classified as such, you have to determine what is the appropriate methodology for revenue recognition on that particular piece. Um, a, a lease, for example, uh, would be a performance obligation and it would be subject to the leasing standards. Uh, whereas uh, certain other things might be subject to other uh, accounting standards. So there's going to be judgment and there's going to be a lot of analysis required. Then we can go to step three. Determine the transaction price. The transaction price may hinge in things like are the option years considered part of one contract or, or are they separate contracts? Uh, and in the later webinar, we'll talk a little bit about how the FASB decides a contract, and I think some of you are going to find that it's not what you're accustomed to. Uh, certainly, incentive and award fees, which are part of many cost plus contracts, and there are certain fixed price contracts where uh, there are various incentive provisions, um, and those can complicate the determination of the contract price because, as we'll see later in the other webinar, those are considered uh, variable consideration. They have to be taken into account. So we can go to step four. Now we have to allocate that transaction price to the performance obligations. And as I said, it doesn't necessarily follow that a separately priced element of a contract will represent the appropriate allocation of a portion of the transaction price. Um, so I'm, I'm just trying to give an example here. If, if you've got a contract that where you're both selling a technology product uh, to the government, plus you're providing a period of extended maintenance on that thing, you've got two separate performance obligations. But and and the revenue is going to be recognized at different points or over time. But not only that, the pricing that's specified in the contract may not be deemed to mirror what the real pricing would be. Uh, in an objective environment. I had a client a number of years ago that was in exactly one of these types of arrangements where for financing reasons, the government agreed to provide them, or, or I should say agreed to price the contract in such a way that they allocated a whole lot of the price to the technology product and a small amount, much smaller amount to the maintenance. Uh, and it was obvious that there was some gaming going on there. And as the auditors for the company, we had we had to actually tell them that you can't you can't do that. You can't recognize all this revenue up front uh, when it doesn't really represent the true value of the product you provided. So there are going to be challenges there. And let's go to the last step five. So now that you've done all of these other steps, you recognize revenue when and importantly or as the entity satisfies a performance obligation. Uh, that, perform, that, that satisfaction can occur at a single point, or it may over, occur over time. And this is the thing that's going to have the biggest impact on accounting for fixed price contracts, where performance does take place over time, typically, uh, but not always. I, I'll give you an example in a minute. 
uh, but the performance obligation may not actually occur until task or contract completion. So uh, it's likely that some contracts where you've been using percentage completion are going to shift to what's known as completed contract method. Hopefully those are going to be short term, but not always. Okay, next slide. So this is going to require some uh, pretty in-depth analysis. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart. The topic itself is lengthy and complex. The original ASU 2014-09, I think it was something like 300 pages long with all the implementing guidance and numerous white papers have been written on it. Uh, some CPA firms that do only a small amount of government contracting uh, clients are going to have a real hard time digesting it and applying it. Um, and another thing to note is that CPA firms can't remain independent if they extensively participate in making the accounting or management de decision and judgment. New topics can require a lot of that. Um, after Enron, the, the, the big four, you know, rid themselves of the absolute, uh, they actually put up like a Chinese wall, so to speak, to make sure that they weren't, uh, you know, assisting in these kinds of things. So I think that is the last slide. Is there another one, uh, Mallory? Okay. So, yeah, that's it. Um, that's that's the basics. And um, uh, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Mallory. And, uh, you know, the, if you're staying on for the second one, we'll have some, some more details to wrap around all this. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and insight today. Today's presentation has been recorded and can be found on our website or YouTube channel within about 48 hours. If you have questions about today's topic, please contact on at the phone number or email shown on the screen. And thank you, everybody. This concludes the webinar.